So obviously, my next question is, Luke Cunningham, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? Uh, I swear I've seen a ghost. <laughs> so I, I was good could not be more excited about this question. So I was in, uh, when I was in college, I was in a place called Herman Hall and there had always been a rumor that Herman Hall was haunted. And uh, I, I am convinced that I turned around and I saw something sitting in a chair in my then, my one of my three roommates at the time, his bedroom. And I was like, and I remember being like, Tommy, and then, I was like, and I like went into his room. I was like, I just saw you sitting here and there was no one there. And I am uh, like, I, mean, I didn't like look at it for a while. I didn't have a conversation. There was no, you know, there was no uh, exchange between us. But I was like, I swear I just saw something sitting here. Someone sitting here. Well, here we are all these years later. It's a, the same conviction I can tell. Uh, has not gone away, and you haven't thought up. Uh, you haven't thought up some way to explain it away. No, no. Do you think so? Do you think flying saucers are real? Absolutely. I. Uh, what is your? What bit of information or entertainment has convinced you the most that flying saucers are real? Because mine is kind of incorporated into the book. Okay, can, I mean, we can give yours away without spoiling the book, right? Yeah. But you want to, you want me to show my cards before you show yours? Am I, am I <laughs> reading there? <laughs> I, well, I guess I, what I'm politely asking is, do you, did you recognize mine in the context of the book? Um, no, uh, I must have I must have missed the part about flying saucers. I got that there was something. Well, you explain it. So, uh, element one fifteen, right? is what is used to encase the MacGuffin over the course of right. the star, star disk because it has a magnetic property that can contain a cold fusion reactor, a nuclear fusion reactor. Oh, with Bob Lazar. I, I know yeah. I missed that completely. There you go. No, so I just read is, right over that. It might as well have been my delayed mouse maker action in 86 or whatever. It was like, okay, well, this is the MacGuffin. It's fine. No, okay, yeah. Yeah. That so that sense. was... That, and and that is the uh, that has convinced me more than anything else are those Bob Lazar I, uh, podcasts and the Bob Lazar footage and the Bob Lazar documentary. Yeah, it's uh, it's it. I'm hard pressed not to believe Bob Lazar. But even without him, I I always have to disclaim that I want it to be true. I don't want us to be the only folks in the universe. I want there to be something greater beyond that we're all eventually going to go and join. Yeah. So I have to be a little bit suspicious of myself just because I know that that, that is my motive of wanting it to be true. But no, I think there's just enough smoke that there's fire. But the number one piece of evidence my grandma saw one and my grandma wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> my grandma a liar. She wouldn't do it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, it's like the, at this point, they've been in the New York Times. Like, we've seen that. And so, uh, my concept is, and honestly, this would be the best case scenario for this book is 20 years from now, some kid with a winning lottery ticket of a brain, and she comes up to me, or they come up to me, and they're like, hey, I read your book. 20 years ago and you were so wrong but it made me wonder how that could work and like this is what i came up with for uh, a cold fusion reactor like this is what i came up with for uh something that uh, you know like a revolutionary field of metallurgy so yeah i mean at this point, I feel like we move beyond, are there, can uh, flying saucers exist? To like, how do they exist? And like, that's what, uh, I feel like that's what Bob Lazar was doing. It's like, hey, they had me working on uh, reverse engineering how flying saucers exist, which is I, that I find like inarguably plausible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the just the, just, the motive behind a long con like that. I, I mean, there are some people that like just 
playing long jokes, but I know he's never, he says he's never taken money, and I, I believe him because he's been able to make enough money doing other yeah. things with his brilliant mind. And he's, it's, it's been since, like, the first, the first video of it is 1987 on Las Vegas local, like, network TV. They interview him, and he's like, yeah, this is, this is what they had me doing. And I, yeah, so I don't know. I, the dream is that some kid reads this and they're the next Bob Lazar, but with far more uh, credibility and hopefully a, a heart that is so ethical that they want to see whatever community they grew up in succeed and flourish. And hopefully they can work in like an open publicly traded office and we can all know that, yeah, they're working on it. Of course they are. Right. It's the C++ of renewable energy. It's one thing that drives me a little bit nuts. And I, I saw Steven Spielberg make this argument, which of all people, come on, man. Yeah. Uh, but the argument that uh, in, in this age where everybody is carrying around a phone in their pocket, where are all the pictures? Where are all the videos? And it's like, dude, have you been on YouTube? <laughs> that's, that's like a third of the internet. It's just yeah. pictures and videos. <laughs> They're not going to be happy until it's that, that scene from Signs and it's just a birthday party in Brazil and then a giant humanoid walks in between the bushes the big no, right that, that won't do it that'll be that'll be just yeah. the guy yeah that, that's just a guy in a suit <laughs> yeah. uh, although i do uh wonder sometimes just because we're getting to the point where with you know deep fakes and everybody else i'm sure you saw the the deep fake video of tom cruise that wasn't yeah. tom cruise and and look at me hosting a video podcast and giving uh, hours of footage to whoever eventually wants to uh, I, I guess scam my PlayStation 5. I haven't got a great deal of value. So I'm probably not a high profile target at this moment. But yeah. perhaps one day. Uh, I, I do wonder um, how we're going to be able to distinguish um, reality from everything else, which I'm kind of excited about. Because when you and I get to be by retirement age, I'm sure you've seen the uh, uh, Black Mirror episode that everybody's um, obsessed with that I can't think of the name of where they play Heaven is a Place on Earth at the end. And they're all in a the, the the seniors are in a virtual reality display and yeah. they go on living in that. I think that's coming. I'm, I'm I welcome it. Yeah, I I mean, I remember that Black Mirror episode. That's also, I mean, like, what's the line between that and the Matrix? Is just you get to live a full life first, and then you're just kind of hooked up to this uh, interface that you're just going to march on forever? Maybe. That's I, pretty sweet. I was, thinking, I was thinking about, like, if you... I would love if you could take all the, like, knowledge that I have. If you could take, like, the like here's the things I've gotten competent at. And if I could just download them to my kids, I'd be thrilled. Be like, hey, you don't have to spend... You, you don't have to spend however many years, like, banging up your hands... Uh, rowing you can do this or like I uh, here's what I learned about how hard it is to uh, to f write a book like the inertia of not writing is so much more fun than the actual writing that but like he, he, here's you learned this Pomodoro session process or I learned it so you don't have to and like find a way to kind of download those things but then like which and this is like maybe this is essentially the same as having children but like their free will is like no i want the time to learn and make those mistakes on my own and what i guess what i'm saying what i would love to do is find a way to like they don't have to make those mistakes like i've already made them here's what i've learned here's how you can apply it and go forward and i would if if it was a situation like that if we we're senior citizens 50 years from now but the collective wisdom can kind of be downloaded into uh, our children and grandchildren like yeah then i'd be psyched then i definitely i would be excited to stick around and see how that works out yeah that'd be good too although i'm, I'm, I'm kind of pumped about the idea of just living on in a <laughs> i don't even care like just wall us off and let them all go back to stone uh cave people times i'm, I'm sorry to see that but hey how sweet is this for us <laughs> and yeah. that is why rich people aren't ethical. <laughs> There's too many of me's up there at that level. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, probably. That, that does tee us up perfectly for what is uh, my my my, my uh, last question. Usually, I try to end the interview here, and that yeah. is, if you could pass on some knowledge, if there is something that you uh, would go back and tell yourself, or you tell future writers that would have made your journey easier and would make their journey easier, will make it easier all the the journey of all the writers who are listening to us. What would you? What would you? What wisdom would you impart? Do the work. Find a way to make the work as efficient as possible, but you have to do the work. And so, like, you're, no one's first draft is good. No one's. Like, no, nothing ever just pours out of your brain onto the page and doesn't get changed. So, you have to find a way to get that first draft done. Whatever method that needs to be, whatever discipline you need to apply to yourself, do it. And uh, if I can recommend the one that worked for me, it's wake up, set your timer, 25 minutes, throw your phone someplace, free write by hand, and then do the same 25 minute method, except you're, you're trying to type out whatever ideas you came up with into something that is hopefully coherent and engaging and fun.